Thank you very much, Liam. Is this on? Yeah, yeah cool. Um, and thanks also to the, the NZSEE for in, inviting me uh, to do this. So today, as Liam said, I want to tell you a little bit about the National Seismic Hazard Model and some of how we put that together and some of what the questions are about it and where we're headed with that. Um, this is it's a work of a massive team of people over the years from geologists, statisticians, um, seismologists, engineering seismologists, um, numerical modelers, and others. So I can't possibly list everybody there. Um, and I'd certainly forget about quite a few if I did that. Um, but so I'm bringing all their work together here. Um, just as a quick outline, just I won't say much, but just briefly into a little bit about earthquakes and tectonics in New Zealand. Um, then the basic introduction into the current National Seismic Hazard Model, um, what the components are that put that together and where we get that and what some of the questions are about that. Um, then a little bit more about the time-dependent model that we developed for, for Canterbury. Um, and then kind of where we're headed with, with the, the next revision of the model and then some final thoughts. Um, I, I don't know how these things are normally run, but I'm happy if you have some questions for clarification on any particular slide, feel free to stop me and ask me as I'm going. Um, so just briefly what the National Seismic Hazard Model is before I get into things, but um, it's really a model that's in the current form is driven by our scientific understanding um, to, for directly to up for applied science. Um, for a probabilistic um, analysis that's used for the, the foundation of the building design standards, site-specific hazard studies um, for various different types of structures and so on, and um, into input into risk calculations for all kinds of different things for, for government and industry. Um, so that's the aim of the model. Um, so just quickly, a little bit about um, earthquakes in New Zealand. Um, not news to most people, but so since since we've been recording earthquakes here since 1840, um, we have about 530,000 earthquakes that we've got in the, in the current catalog. Um, that's of all, all different uh, magnitudes in the GeoNet catalog. Um, since about 1970, we're 22 magnitudes greater than seven that we've recorded in the country, including some offshore events. Um, lucky, luckily enough, most of those have been far from populated areas. Um, and then one greater than magnitude eight since 1840 is the largest one that we've had in kind of historical times. In early years in the catalog, um, really almost pre-1940, um, we only get the largest events, so magnitude sixes and so on. Do we, do we really know anything about smaller than that? We may maybe have them, we maybe don't, we most likely don't. Um, and in recent years, particularly the last kind of 10, 15 years, we can get down to magnitude two for most places in the country. Some places we get lower, just really depends on the, the density of the network and how noisy the location is and so on. Um, but the completeness of that, so meaning how well we actually record magnitudes is highly variable around the country and particularly in time. This rapidly goes up as you go back in the catalog and the catalog is actually quite a tricky thing to deal with. Um, I'll show some slides later. Um, but magnitude estimation is also inconsistent in time. So magnitude is a model in the end. There's lots of different ways you can estimate magnitude. There's no true magnitude and that causes us all kinds of interesting challenges. Um, so what about the plate boundary? That's really the, the big question. Um, I'm not sure what's happened there. Um, so as, as I think most of you know, we sit astride the plate boundary here. And what people are really talking about when they say that is the interface between the Pacific plate and the Australian plate, um, where we have um, offshore the, the east coast of the North Island. We have the Hikarangi Trough, where we have about relative motion of the Pacific plate moving towards the, the Australian plate. We have about 45 millimeters per year up here. Um, where the Pacific Plate is going underneath the Australian Plate. And then as you go through Cook Strait onto the South Island, that, that motion kind of transforms into the strike slip fault, which is dominated by the Alpine Fault and a different network of faults as you kind of get up into Marlborough. Um, and then as you get down off the bottom end of the South Island um, into Pusigur, you get about 38 millimeters per year in that direction. So that's, it's those that are driving more or less all the earthquakes that we have around the country. Um, and that's, that's the, the dominant fault um, that we have. And just for another view of it, which I think is, is quite an interesting way to looking at, look at it, looking north to south, here you can really see the subduction zone going here um, along the east coast. So this is really the expression of, of the subduction zone. 
Um, I think as you, it, the, it's, it's not slipping everywhere. Some places it's currently locked. And down underneath Wellington, I think the dip, the average dip on the fault is something like about 12 degrees, which means, so it, it heads off in this direction, um, and it's about 20 to 25 kilometers beneath the city of Wellington. And there's no reason to think, I'll talk more about this later, but there's no reason to think really that this whole thing couldn't, couldn't go at once. We have very little evidence of anything. We know very little about this abduction zone, um, but the whole thing going at once, we could have something equivalent to what happened in Japan in 2011, and we're really trying to understand that better. Um, so now into the model itself. Um, it's gone through an evolution. Here's a snapshot of a few pictures of the years. One of the first ones was this one from Trevor Matushka in 1985. Um, and then you, really the biggest change came between 1985 and 98 when Mark Sterling came up with kind of a more modern um, version of PSHA. And you can see the differences there where faults started to be included in the model. And that's what had the big jump from here to here. And then it's been smaller revisions really since that time. Um, so I'll tell you now um, a bit more about what goes into that. Um, so I've lost a figure here. Um, the National Seismic Hazard Model, um, it's not really a model in the end. It's an algorithm. It's the way we bring together a bunch of different smaller component models and assumptions to come up with these kind of final end results. Um, it follows the fundamental concepts of probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, or PSHA, as laid out by Alan Cornell in 1968. Um, it can produce all kinds of different outputs, many of which get used by you guys in different ways. Um, but a very typical output um, is a forecast, something like the ground shaking we expect with a 10% probability of exceedance in the next 50 years. I just wanted to make a few comments about that um, before I get into things. Um, so we talk, we, as, we, as I say, 10% in 50-year map is common. That com quite often or more often than not gets referred to as either a 475-year return period map or maybe um, rounded to a 500-year return period map. Um, and you go from this to this by making the assumptions that earthquake rates do not change in time, or they're Poissonian if you're into that sort of thing. Um, however, we know that's, that's not correct. Um, we know that earthquakes aren't random in time. And in fact, we don't necessarily model in that way. In all parts of the seismic hazard model, we have time dependence. Even in a national model, there's time dependence. Um, so the implication of that is the use of moving things to return period is incorrect. Now, in most cases, maybe that doesn't matter. It just leads to some misunderstandings of what's going on. But in some cases, particularly when you get into risk assessment, that becomes a bit more important. So what the 10% in 50-year map is really doing, and that's accounting for the uncertainty on the rates that we expect in the next 50 years. Um, so just as a small example, we would expect, even in the national model, we, it would expect, if we extracted an annual rate from the model, we'd expect that to be different for 2020 than 2030 or 2040. Um, it's maybe a, a relatively minor issue now, other than causing some fundamental understandings of what we're actually modeling and how earthquakes work. Um, but as we move into more into time dependence, this will become more important. OK, so as I mentioned, the, um, the national model is an algorithm that combines different component models and assumptions. So it's, it really is necessary to merge these large kind of disparate data sets that represent different time periods, different levels of completeness, different quality, and so on, and come up with out of that, well, how out of all that different information to get the best representation of hazard for the next 50 years. So just the, the main, main components um, that go into it. Um, first are the historical earthquake locations. Where, where, are the, where will the earthquakes occur? Um, next is how big, how often, um, the magnitude frequency distributions. Um, and the third one is the ground motion prediction. So once we know where, they're, how big, where they are, how big they are going to be, what do we expect the ground motions to be? Um, so I'll probably say a few times in the talk, I'll talk about sources. And when I talk about sources, I really just mean where and how big. I don't mean anything about ground motion. And when I talk about ground motion prediction, that's really what I'm referring to, the ground motion. That tends to be how we break things up. Um, so now into, into the source modeling. Um, so first starting at the long-term processes, we look at the fault model that goes into the National Seismic Hazard Model. And in terms of sources, this is really the, the dominant component. This is what controls the hazard. 
Um, here's an example of, of the fault model, or this is the fault model that we use in the national model. It's based on what we call the active faults database, which has, the active faults database has thousands of fault traces mapped around the country. Most of those we don't really know anything about. We may not even know if they go deep into the, into the subsurface. Um, so this is the interpretation of that um, into the national model. Um, so we assume in the model that each one of these fault sources are, are characteristic sources, meaning that they, they more or less repeat with the same sort of magnitude and the same sort of kind of recurrence interval on them. Um, that's, that's not strictly true, but that's a simple way of explaining how that happens. Um, the magnitudes that are used are, are defined by different ways. I mean, overall, they're controlled by magnitude scaling relationships, which are empirical relationships that have um, come from global data as well as New Zealand data. Um, that look at how long a fault is and how much slip it occur, occurs on and how big the earthquakes um, are, typically are. Uh, but then that's validated um, in a couple of different ways at least. One, paleoseismic constraints, which I'll talk a bit more um, about in a minute, and also with uh, geodetic data. So currently we have um, 536 fault sources in the, in the model. So we have a lot mapped up and down the country. Um, so just a little bit of how, they, how they, they get at those fault sources. Some are obvious. I think most of us here know about the Wellington Fault, and as long as we're in the air, we could pick that out. If we're on the ground, it might be a bit more difficult. Um, but then you get into places like the, the TVZ and the Tapo Volcanic Zone, and it gets to be pretty tricky. There are, I don't know, how many of thousands of little sources in here. Um, and it certainly takes a bit of geologist magic to go from what they see in the surface and exploring the area to figure out where the faults are and to be able to map those. And one of the complications, particularly in the TVZ, is a lot of these have relatively small surface or near surface expressions. Um, so you have to, it's not really known how well they connect up at depth. Are these all actually individual smaller sources that will only ever break as small sources and have small earthquakes? Or do they connect up at depth and they have the potential to make a much, much longer rupture and a much larger um, event? So that's certainly one of the challenges. Um, then once they've identified the, the surface traces the, when they can, um, and they've done this lots of places around the country, they actually go in with the backhoe and they, they dig out the top few meters of, of the fault to try to figure out what's going on with it. And if they're lucky, they get dry conditions and they get good data, or they get good, I guess good data like this, um, where yeah, you can see the different, here's the fault is running through here, and you can see the different layers on, on each side and how they, they've kind of been offset. So they can go through and they date each one of these layers, um, which of course come with their own uncertainties on that, and then make an interpretation based on that by kind of um, going backwards through the structure of how this all would have mapped up through time so they can get a number of events that have occurred on that particular fault and roughly um, how far apart they've happened in time. And if they do this enough places on a fault, they can then start to get an idea of what ruptures might have lined up together and how long any particular event might be. And so this is kind of some of the fundamental information that's in controlling what we know about faults, as this, as this has been done lots of places around the country. Um, and this, I put this one in just because I, I quite like this one. Even This is one even I can, I can understand, not being a geologist. So this is in the Y-Rapa fault, um, just um, alongside the Oranga-Oranga ranges. So this is a fault that ruptured in 1855 with a magnitude 8.1, so the largest historical earthquake that we know about. And it also has the largest slip on it of any strike slip event known in the world. So it's a big, massive event. Um, so what you see here is this hill right here in the foreground. That's the fault scarp. And here you see this tree-filled channel right here. This is where the modern day river is coming out. And if you go over to, the, this is Mark Sterling here. If you go over to the other side of this, you can kind of see this little cutout that's very similar to that. That's where the stream was coming out in 1855. Um, and if you go back here, which is more or less the same distance, you see where it was about 1,500 years before that. And then you can't really see it in this picture, but there's kind of a vague channel that, that shows up here. Um, so what I, like, what, I, what I like to think about is if you're sitting right here in 1855, the Lake of the Wai Rapa or, or is just out here a little bit. You have sat up here in a matter of minutes, you would have seen the Lake of the Wai Rapa move to the south 18 meters. So a big, massive slip. And if you go to the south, um, about 40 kilometers to 
track or our head sticking out into Cook Strait. Um, there's a series of earthquake terraces where I think it's a bit controversial, but the maximum uplift from some of those events is about seven meters. So the vertical slip of seven meters and horizontal of 18. So big, big event. Possibly this one ruptured the subduction zone when it went. Okay, so we have 536 maps or faults mapped in the National Seismic Hazard Model fault model. Um, it's more than anywhere else in the world, but we know we don't have them all, particularly for M75s and smaller, possibly some bigger ones. So what we do about that is we then go back through the, the, the GeoNet catalog, and we're looking here at medium-term processes, so let's back to 1840, um, and we develop what is called the smooth seismicity component model. Um, so this is really just based on the catalog, and there's some kind of fundamental statistics that have been done about earthquakes around the world, some basic relationships that they follow. Uh, this isn't a particularly good example, but the frequency magnitude distribution, so there's the Gutenberg-Richter relationship, which describes the slope of this and kind of the absolute values that come out of that. And you can do some st simple statistics on that that are pretty robust, um, and you can map that out. And the way these smooth seismicity models work is that they basically assume that the future is going to be like the past. The big question is how far back in the past you have to go to understand what the future is going to be like. Is the last 50 years the best representation? Is the last 10 years? Is the last 2,000 years? We don't really have the answer to that, that question. Um, so what we do here is, as I say, it's filling in the gaps of the missing faults. Um, we use M greater than 4. Actually, we go smaller than that. Um, so although kind of at the engineering end, we're only interested in the larger earthquakes, because of this Gutenberg-Richter scaling relationship, there's a lot of good information in the smaller events that can tell us about the larger events. And because we just don't have that many large events, we have to rely on the smaller events to help us understand these statistics. So that's why it's important that we get good quality from the GeoNet catalog. Um, and we can, there's lots of different ways you can come up with these smooth seismicity models, but basically you do some sort of spatial interpolation of the earthquake data um, to come up with this. And we, we use this, currently using this 50K Gaussian, and we haven't just kind of pulled, plucked that out of the air. We've kind of statistically optimized that, looking at lots of different ways we can do it and looking at testing, so developing forecasts on subset of the catalog and testing against another set and figuring out which one's doing best. Um, and an important part of this is you, you, because it's based on this Gutenberg-Richter relationship, the slope uh, here that I showed you, you have to end it somewhere. You either tape it or taper it or chop it off, but you have to assume some sort of M max. Now, right now, everywhere in the country except for the TVZ, this is 7.2. Um, depending on who you talk to, they may or may not believe this. I would say this is too small. Some of the geologists would say this is probably okay, but I think Geologists are changing their mind, and this is this will likely this will be coming up, I assume. And the TVZ, it's a bit smaller um, because most of the geologists don't think most of those faults will ever link up to really big events. But keeping in mind that that Mmax is only for the background; it doesn't apply to the faults. Um, so you end up with something like, whoops, something like this. Um, which this just is a relative rate around the country, so it looks more or less like a smooth version of what you get out of the earthquake catalog, so nothing, nothing too surprising there. And the, the, the black boxes that we show on here are how we break it up for certain parameter estimations that we have to do that I don't want to go into. So then the final kind of component, really looking at the short term, is the geodetic information that we get. Now, we've only really had this for the last 10 or 20 years. Um, so it's short term from that perspective. We're not really sure what it represents. Um, but we're using, currently it gets used to kind of constrain some of the other, other parameters. And it's getting used in certain models that we're in the process of developing that are indicating that there's a whole lot of good information in terms of what's currently going on that may be the most relevant for the next kind of 10 to 20 years in that geodetic information. I, mean, I guess a good benefit of this is that you have excellent spatial coverage of the geodetic information. Um, kind of the final main component then, as I mentioned, is the empirical ground motion prediction models um, called ground motion prediction equations, or GMPEs, typically. Um, so the relations between magnitude, distance, and some measure of ground motion amplitude. 
Um, they're based on observations, so they're relatively small data sets, so it's typically done using global data with some local data thrown in there. I'll talk more about that. It does include uncertainties in the modeling, so if you look at um, this, you can see here would be a prediction on this particular data set with the uncertainties in there, but you'll also notice this big data gap here. We don't really have, I mean, this is only one small data set, um, but you don't have a lot of near source um, data to develop these from. We're getting more all the time, um, but there's still really not that much. Um, and you can predict many different intensities um, with this. Let's go into a bit more, a bit more detail here. Um, so I guess a point I want to make with this slide is a lot of what we have to do with earthquakes, we don't really have data, we have models. We have to, we're looking from the subsurface trying to understand what's going underneath. So everything, as I said, magnitude is essentially a model and even understanding the, the ground shaking that ultimately comes down to a model. So there's lots of assumptions and I guess modeling that has to go on to make that happen. Um, and what I'm showing here is a new strong ground motion database that's just been finished off by um, Chris Van Hout, um, at, who's now at GNS. Um, and this is all New Zealand data. Um, it's, it's kind of the, the biggest data set that we've had, um, and it's been carefully gone over by a big team of, of people who have put this all together. Um, so we currently have 270 earthquakes, greater than 272, greater than magnitude 4, 4,000 recorded ground motions. Um, the largest events um, we have, we've Associated, associated those with the slip models. We, we have a finite fault that's been estimated and how the, the slip, how much the, the fault slipped, which is important information when you're developing these GMPEs. Uh, manually filtered records, um, site class, some observations, a whole lot of modeling that's gone into that. Um, key thing here is a lack of subduction events in that, that data set. Um, so for GMP development in New Zealand, um, we, we're heavily reliant on global data. Um, we, in the past, different people have done it, have used some New Zealand data, um, but we have, we have a lot more now. Um, so in the current national model, um, we've been for 15 years, we've been using the, the McVary um, ground motion prediction equation. I won't really go into the details. Um, but it uses expressions for different rupture types, so for strike, slip, thrust, so on. It, it, it does things slightly differently. Um, and it's regionalized around the country, um, whether or not it's, it's subduction events, a TVZ event, or so on. It, it treats the, the, the ground motion prediction differently. So I'll talk more about ground motion a little bit later. And now the, four, the last thing I put up here is site class. This is, this is not a model component, but since it's and it's, it's like far from my area of knowledge, I have to say. Um, but it really is one of the key uncertainties in seismic hazard estimation. Um, and that's, that's why I wanted to put it up here, because it, 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 is, it is very important. Um, there's lots of debates about different issues. People in here probably know more than me about some of this. Uh, VS30 versus site class is, is a big one, um, where things are done two different ways. And you can find people that argue on both sides of that. Um, just bringing up this whole model thing once again, um, that an important part of this debate for both sides of this is globally and in New Zealand, a large portion proportion of the, the VS30 data that's used even in the ground motion prediction equation, so say the, the peer database, which is kind of the gold standard for, for developing ground motion prediction equations, a large part of that VS30 data is actually a model or an estimate. It's not necessarily a true, true VS30. So it's just something to keep in mind and the uncertainties that go into this. So then, in the end, it comes down to the outputs that, that most people in here are, are familiar with. OK, now shift a little bit into kind of what we've done for Canterbury, which is kind of taken these same core components that we do for the national model and then kind of put a, t a more time-dependent framework onto that to respond to the, the ongoing earthquake activity there, or expected ongoing earthquake activity there. Um, but first, I just wanted to put up this slide, talking about time scales for earthquake hazard. I didn't really have time independent on here, which is the way most people would think about the national model. Um, but at the extreme short end, in a very different space, which quite often gets confused with time dependent hazard, um, is the reason I wanted to put it up here, is earthquake early warning. And this is something that doesn't happen until after an earthquake already begins. So the earthquake already ruptures, you've recorded ground motions at some stations, which give you enough information to quickly then predict what might happen at some distance away. Um, so it gives it a quick warning for a kind of immediate response. Um, and it's 
possibly useful or, um, and has been useful in Japan for things like trains and so on, but it's very different than what we talk about when we mean time-dependent hazard, which is still kind of a predictive thing before anything even starts. Um, and this time-dependent hazard can in, mean many different things and gets used and lost to different ways. You can talk about very short-term hazard where you say what's going to happen tomorrow, or you can go into different time frames, um, which is what we've done for Canterbury, and it's been used in very different ways for all these different time frames all the way up to, to 50 years. And this can be based on many different things, not just aftershock activity. Um, so just a bit about earthquake clustering. Um, as I mentioned, kind of early on, um, kind of when you t start talking about return periods, you're assuming that earthquakes are random in time. We know that's really not correct. We know that earthquakes are clustered, meaning they group together, and then there's quiet times and they group together. And that can be at all kinds of different scales. That could be on a daily scale, or that could be on a decadal scale. And we, we have examples of this in New Zealand, where, say, kind of the Northwest South Island is kind of an example of a kind of a decadal scale cluster that's that's um, going on now. But just as a, a kind of a quick primer, really, just in the, the aftershock space, when we talk about earthquake clustering, um, what we mean is you have relatively quiet times. You might have one event. So you have an increased probability that happens immediately after that one event. That probability of some other events happening, whatever magnitudes those might be, the, the probability is the, the scale, the increase in probability is independent of magnitude. It's not magnitude dependent. Of course, the absolute value is magnitude dependent, but it goes up uniformly across all magnitudes. Um, and then nothing happens, so that decays away. Then you get another little foreshock here. The probabilities, sorry, these are the earthquakes here. You get another foreshock here. The probabilities jump up. Um, and then you do, at that point, have a larger one, which after the fact, you call it the main shock, um, and then those probabilities gradually decay in time as your 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 aftershock activity kind of slows down over time. But then it could all because these probabilities are still high, they're reflecting the fact that it may all get initiated again, which which quite often happens. So there's lots of different ways you could define this. Really, there's no there's no true definition of what an aftershock is, and that's what causes a lot of difficulty in communications between different groups. Um, around the place, but roughly half the events in the catalog, you might say, are aftershocks. Um, so this initial idea of how aftershocks work, um, it's, it's, it's the, the oldest law we have in seismology. Um, and it first came out in 1891 by, by this guy named Omori um, in Japan. And this is, um, this is a plot of uh, aftershock sequence that began in Nobi in 1891. Um, and this shows 100 years of recorded aftershocks. Um, so this is time here, a number of aftershocks. So you can see at this, this particular location, even 100 years later, you're still really seeing this, this, this power lock trend in the DDK and the rate of aftershocks, which is really what the Omori law is describing based on this whole, all these this clustering ideas. So this is kind of the fundamental of a lot of what, what the really simple um, time-dependent modeling does. So now on to um, what we've done in Canterbury for the time-dependent model really in this response to this, this cluster of, of earthquakes that we've had. Um, so we put together um, a rate model, really kind of the background seismicity model you can pick up. We still use the faults, but this would be replacing the background seismicity part. Um, and our goal with this is there's a large amount of uncertainty in this process, and we really wanted to try to account for that uncertainty in what we've done. Um, so we have three different components that we put together. First is the short-term clustering component part, and that's really the, that's the, the traditional Omori decay, the Omori aftershock-like behavior. Um, next is the medium-term clustering scale. Um, this um, goes kind of a decadal scale, really kind of five to 20 years is where that fits in. Um, and then we have the long-term seismicity, and that's after 20 years after this clustering starts to slow down, where do we expect the long-term rate to be? And this is actually the biggest uncertainty in the whole thing. I think there's been some, uh, I've heard in various presentations and things, there's a lot of confusion, I think, about how, how, the, how the model works, but these two, in the end, these two aren't really all that different in terms of the actual rates that they produce. Um, it's this long-term component where there's a massive uncertainty across the kind of when you talk to the experts um, of how much you actually, where do you expect the rate to be in 20 to 50 years? Uh, so we have a big spread represented in this uh, model, and this is really what's contributing um, significantly to that, that long-term rate. Um, 
I won't say too much about this, but I just really put this up here to remind me that all the models that we use to construct this are models that have been around for, say, 10 to 20 years and are models that we've statistically tested in kind of um, New Zealand and Japan and the U.S. and other places around the world. So we have a pretty good idea of how these models work and how much kind of predictive skill that, um, that we have. So we purposely chose models that we knew how they worked um, before we put this whole thing together. On the, the ground motion prediction side, um, again, with this focus on really trying to understand the uncertainty because we're making a fairly big change in how we do things, we want to make sure that we're capturing the uncertainty in that. Um, so we've gone to a hybrid or combined GMPE model where just because it's been used for so long, we stuck with the McBerry model as, as one part, and we've also moved to the in addition to that, we've added in the Bradley subregion model, and we actually use different, kind of a couple of different parameter combinations on this to try to account for um, the different uncertainties in that for it to come up with the prediction. So we have multiple uncertain, multiple models in there to, in the ground motion space and other space. I guess it's quite often called the epistemic uncertainty. You can kind of think of that as the model uncertainty that we're trying to capture by using this this range of models, saying that we don't know which one of these models or their different parameters really the right one. They're, they're both plausible models, um, and they both represent some part of the data, and the, um, the best prediction is, is generally come by combining those together, and that's what we've done here. Um, so now on to kind of where we're headed in the future. Um, as you saw from one of those early slides, um, for the past 15 years, there haven't been any kind of fundamental changes to what we do with the National Seismic Hazard Model. Um, it's, we've collected a whole lot more faults. We've more than doubled the number of faults we have had that, but in it. But some of the fundamental science has stayed really the same. So we're really looking at that, taking a step back, and seeing what some of the biggest issues are um, with the model and where we can kind of make the kind of the most useful changes in the way that we, we do things. Um, so we it started off with a series of kind of brainstorming workshops where we got together um, on probably on the order of about 50, 50 different experts, mostly from New Zealand, but some overseas people to, to try to think about some of that. Um, so some of the key objectives are new hybrid model um, for long term seismic hazard in New Zealand. Um, I'll talk more about that um, a bit later. Um, and I, I think probably, as you can see from a lot of what I've talked about, there, there, there's necessarily a fair bit of subjectivity in how you put one of these, these models together because we don't know what the right answer is. Um, so we have to go on expert opinion. And un unfortunately, the way you do that and the way you collect expert opinions and who the experts are adds a massive amount of uncertainty to the process itself. Um, and that's actually, a, there's whole fields of research who look into that side of things. So we try to learn a lot from them and take on board what they're doing. Um, bringing in larger and international community, what we can learn from Canterbury, which is a lot. Um, and then kind of maybe two important things for this, for this group, uh, moving to an open source software platform, which um, OpenSHA is one from the USGS, and OpenQuake is from GEM, the Global Earthquake Model, if you're familiar with that. We're probably going both ways. Right now we've, we've got it into OpenQuake. We're trying to we're not getting the same answers that out of our other code. We're trying to validate that for, or figure out what's going on there. Um, but that'll be that'll be available once that's done. And we're also working on um, web web platform, so we'll be able to kind of hazard results will be available online. Um, so as I mentioned, challenge some of the key PSHA assumptions. Talk a lot about it, uncertainties. That's that's the space I'm in right now. And uncertainties are important, particularly for the end users. Um, and being able to put those uncertainties in some useful form and not just confusing everybody, but actually being able to put that into something that's helpful. Um, consider inputs from different time frames and how we can put that into a way that it can actually be used. And then starting to, to move towards simulated ground motions to get beyond some of the limitations of the ground motion prediction equations. Um, so now I want to focus on source model uncertainties, particularly here. That's not because we don't have the same issues with ground motion prediction equations um, and ground motion prediction, but just um, what I wanted to talk about here today a little bit. Um, so get back to the, the magnitude thing. Um, magnitude is a tricky, tricky beast, um, and it's particularly important because we have to go from source models, which are forecasting rates of events in some magnitude range, and they have to talk to ground motion prediction equations, which are forecasting ground motions based on some particular magnitude, and trying to get those two magnitudes to actually meet up is, is tricky, and it can cause, so say if you have 
perspectives, right? If you have, say, you used one magnitude metric here and another here, and there was maybe just a 0.2 magnitude offset, you wouldn't think that would be a big deal. But that's about a doubling of the rates because of the Gutenberg-Richter power law, the way that works, which then goes to about a 20 to 30 percent change in hazard, depending on where you are and what's dominating the hazard. So small changes in magnitude can be important for the ultimate hazard. So what we're looking at here are two snapshots from this part of the country from the GeoNet catalog. Here is 2007. We have six, about 1,700 magnitude greater than three. Um, and this is pretty representative of the years around it. And then we go to 2012, look at the same part of the country, and we have 306 magnitude greater than three. And again, this is representative of the years around it. Now this doesn't mean that suddenly all the earthquakes turned off and we have a lot fewer um, earthquakes in the central North Island. This is, GeoNet has changed from one system of identifying and locating and estimating magnitudes to another. And suddenly we get a massive change in the number of earthquakes that we have above a given threshold. Um, there's some thinking that maybe we've known for a long time that this cusp system was overestimating slightly deeper magnitudes. So that's part of it, the yeah, magnitudes of deeper events. Um, but that's not all what's going on, but it is primarily due to the system. But this happens throughout the catalog. So when you're trying to deal with the catalog, and if you're not aware of these issues, it causes problems. And when you're aware of them, it, it gives you lots of headaches. Um, so now this is, so getting to the fault model, this is having some, um, I like to challenge the paleo seismologists a lot because they don't, they don't tend to think about things so statistically. Um, so having some uh, good discussions with the paleo seismology team, I just said, okay, well, if we could go back 180 years and you could start all over again knowing what we know now about how you do science, how many earthquakes over the next 180 years would occur on faults that we actually knew about ahead of time? So it's a thought experiment, um, but possibly an interesting one. So here's just a map of some of the larger events that have happened over um, since 1840. And there's a whole lot of results that have come out of this in lots of ways you can look at it. But basically, the, the short answer is about half of the earthquakes over the last, since 1840, would have happened, of large earthquakes, would have happened on faults that we would have, have known about ahead of time. So the question is, and does that really line up with what we're saying in the national model and where we're putting future earthquakes. Um, so we start to look at that a little bit more. Um, now this slide's a bit tricky. Um, hopefully I'll be able to explain this well. Um, so I've just broken this down into two groups. Here we've got, this is largely based on work from Andy Nickel and Russ Fendison, um, myself and Mark Sterling. Um, but we've broken this down into to fast moving faults. Um, so these are with return, uh, recurrence intervals of less than 1,250 years. We're calling those fast moving faults. And these gray circles are the data, and the, the, the squares are the kind of what comes out of the model. And it's a log scale here, but in my mind, those, the matches of those recurrence intervals, that's OK. I mean, given the size of this data set and the uncertainties involved, you would never expect it to be perfect, but that, that's kind of OK. Go to the slow moving faults, so I've jumped the middle interval here, but you go to the slow moving faults, so greater than 10,000 years. And it orders a magnitude difference between the two, where there's a lot more in the, a lot more fast moving, slow moving faults um, in the historic, in the observations than we have in the model. It's, it gets a bit tricky because it might be backwards from what you're thinking of it. But basically, that's what it's saying is when you break it down, possibly there's on the order of 400 additional magnitude greater than 6.5 faults required to match this discrepancy. Now you might think, okay, that's what we're doing, the background model, we're trying to make up for that, but we're probably not making up that much of a difference. So this was a bit of an eye opener, and the question that we need to sort out is where is that balance wrong? Do we have the wrong number of earthquakes, or are we just putting the earthquakes in the wrong place? Um, I think we're starting to understand that, and we're really, we're working on a model that better, better balances this. But I, I suspect this is a problem that's lots of places around the world have. Um, largely because you're dealing with this slightly subjective data that makes things tricky. Um, now into this Poisson assumption and time independence that I keep going on. Um, traditional PSHA, which is more or less the way it's done everywhere around the world, um, you decluster the catalog when you deal with it. So you, you go through your catalog since 1840 and you take out any after, anything that you think is an aftershock, you remove from it, then you develop your smooth seismicity model based on that. 
And that's because it's tricky to deal with clusters and making sure that you're not putting too many earthquakes in a cluster that was over 100 years ago. Um, but we know that's wrong. Um, and because you assume they're Poisson, that, uh, a Poisson uncertainty is typically pretty small. Um, that uncertainty doesn't really matter in the bigger picture of what you're doing. But the problem with that is that it's actually ignoring the larger uncertainty um, that we know Poisson is not actually correct. Um, so the uncertainty is larger than what's modeled in um, PSHA kind of globally in the way everybody does it. Um, and just to give a little bit of perspective, so earthquake clustering, so aftershock clustering particularly is one thing that we do understand a whole lot better. Um, and if we look at the, this, this here, this is models of different rates over 50 years, just purely based on aftershock clustering. And you can see even here, there's a big spread in possible rates that come out of that. So the uncertainty there is large, and that's much better constrained than this. So it's really trying to get an understanding of what that model uncertainty is in the, in the kind of more traditional PSHA space. And we're working on how we can get this clustering in a useful form into the model um, through some hybrid models, which I'll talk about later in a few minutes. A um, couple more examples here. Low seismicity regions and lack of data. As you've seen, current PSHA is really built upon knowing where earthquakes have happened in the past. Um, and particularly challenging here, I guess, is low seismicity areas, say Auckland or, or um, um, down in Otago, um, where we have little data, so I think we have something like 100 magnitude fours that have been recorded in the catalog in, in Auckland and, and Northland, is that how representative, given that tiny amount of data, how representative is, is, is that of the next 50 years? How much do we really know there? Um, and so with less data, the uncertainty is necessarily higher, but without having a model, that's difficult, difficult to quantify. Um, so again, one way around this is starting to work towards physics-based simulations where you can simulate millions of years of catalogs and really try to understand what's happening in this, this lower seismicity area. Um, spatial resolution, I think this might be the last one. Um, so you, some of you may have heard me say this before, but so if we take the whole country, we forget about space, and we say, okay, in the next 50 years, how many Earth weeks are we going to have, and what will their magnitude distribution look like? We do pretty well. If we start to break that down on a 10 kilometer square grid, which is what's used in the design standard and so on, we don't do quite as well. Um, obviously, the whole country is probably not much use, saying at that level. So it's where in between really is the best resolution um, to provide information for the end users for, for regulation and planning. And I think that's something that, that requires a bit more discussion. I'll say something again about that later on. So, I, I, um, so to get around some of these difficulties, I've, I've mentioned a few things about hybrid models. And hybrid models are really trying to capture the uncertainty of the spread across plausible models for what might go on given what we know. Um, here's just a subset of 12 smooth seismicity models that we have for New Zealand. We have a lot more. Um, and the idea with hybrid models um, is that you have these different models. Some of them may be purely seismicity based, so different clustering scales, declustered, a learning catalog of 10 years, a learning catalog of 180 years. Um, some might include geodetic data, um, which I mentioned is showing really promising. This is a bit of a dream here, but I, I think with what we're learning, slow slip events on the subduction zone, there's probably a lot that can go into this from that. Fault models, so we have physical information that can start to include in these catalog-based models. So you can, you can combine these models, and because of the form that they're done in, you can kind of statistically optimize these models over, unfortunately, relatively short time frames. But you can be looking at 20 to 30 year time frames to optimize these models to really see what kind of information is in there so you can kind of improve what you know in some of the areas where you might have less information in traditional sense of putting together the model. So the idea really with the hybrid model is combining together multiple data sets to get around some of the deficiencies of any of the individual data sets and accounting for uncertainty. And it, um, it's used in lots of areas, other areas of science, and it, and it seems to be working well for us. Um, and here's just one example. Um, so this was just, there's lots of different ways you can do this. Um, so this was, the model was optimized on data from 1986 to 2007. Um, and it took 
I don't, I'm not sure how many models went into it. There were probably 20 models um, that started out, and then it just did, did all kinds of different combinations of those, and then actually prospectively tested those. So you set it, you're not fitting parameters at this point. You say, okay, we optimize it over this time period, and then in 2007, we stop and we test it prospectively against all data for, in this case, the next seven years. And you can see which model did well in both time periods. I mean, really, you need to be doing well prospectively or else you're not learning a lot. And what came out of that, interestingly, was a stationary uniform plus on model, which is a significant contributor. And if I had a map of this model up, it would be the same color everywhere. So it would be saying, we don't know anything about space. We know how many they're going to be, but we don't know where they're going to be. So that was that had information in it, um, good information. Proximity to map faults, so that's saying, so we're, this is all based on the earthquake catalog, but if it, then you kind of scale that up and down based on where we know the faults are, that's helping out. Um, this is, this is the, the catalog-based one. Um, this is another smooth seismicity one, so this is the, the traditional one that we've optimized based out of the National Seismic Hazard Model, and this is another one based on the fault locations. So this combination of information out of all the different things that we had available to us gave us significantly better predictions, at least in this time frame, than anything else. So it was, it's important to... Matt, can you just explain the color scheme on that? Because it's a bit counterintuitive for me that, that I see it, the yellow is a higher rate than Yes, and that's that's correct. Yeah, that's these. This one always confuses me too. But <laughs> yeah, so you just think of it, this. Think of this as a relative rate. Ignore the, any of the absolute numbers, and just the yellow is the higher. So you can see in this case, it is largely dominated, but not entirely, by fault locations. Yeah, it probably it probably should be flipped around. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now um, a bit on to ground motion prediction um, and same sort of ideas. We have lots of different ways we can represent the future ground motion predictions. They might all be equally plausible based on the data. They may not be equally plausible. Um, so how do, we, how do we use, how do we get the best prediction we have given these kind of disparate models? Um, and, and the large uncertainty across that, I guess. The, and certainly, the inter we haven't, in New Zealand, we tr traditionally have always just stuck with the McBerry GMPE, um, for lack of having other models that it was thought were appropriate for New Zealand. But certainly, the international standard is to use multiple models. There's no consensus on the best way to use multiple models, but certainly, the, the standard is using logic trees. So I won't really go into the details of that. But there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. Um, some are much a bit more much a bit more clever than others, um, and this is we're looking into a lot of these right now, trying to to get our heads around some of the benefits um, and disadvantages of of using some of these. Um, and one way that we start to do this is in the, this big data set that Chris is, Chris and others have have put together, is we can start to evaluate all the different models on the on this New Zealand specific data set. Um, and we've got lots of different results that have come out of this, um, but I've just kind of predict picked one that was the most representative. The results are all consistent against all the different tests that we've done. Some are just stronger than others. Um, so we've taken the two models that we use in New Zealand, the McVary and the Bradley 2010, um, which both have New Zealand specific data in them, but older data, and in some ways maybe not as good of data as we have now. And we compared those to these NGA2 models, which are kind of some of the, the most prominent global models that have been developed based on, on global data sets. And we compare all those um, to this New Zealand data set that's been put together. Um, it uses negative log likelihood score here, um, or if you're not familiar with that, you can basically think of it as similar to a residual, but you're also taking into account the uncertainties in the predictions, because those uncertainties are important. If we're doing a probabilistic hazard assessment, we need to know what that uncertainty spread is, so we want to see how much information is actually in that. Um, and the results that have come out of this are that these two New Zealand more or less specific models, when we look at this newer data, surprisingly, they don't, they don't perform as well as these, these globally developed models. And you can see here is, in this particular way of looking at it, see so very standing out here, um, which is as, you get, as the log likelihood score gets larger, it does poorer. I mean, that's maybe not a surprise to many people. I mean, I think Graham is not even too surprised at that, that it's, a, it's an old model. Um, it's not doing so well. Um, and then the Bradley is this one here. So it's, it's much more in line with what the other models are doing. 
Um, and you can see as you get out to the longer um, periods, it's, it's, it's like likelihood score gets even worse. Uh, but interestingly, it compares to, it's based, the Bradley, two, oh, I guess it's 2013, sorry. The, um, the initial Bradley model was based on an older Chu and Young's model, which has since been revised, and has just tweaked the New Zealand data. And um, when you have this newer data set, it doesn't seem to be doing quite as well, which if you didn't have that Chu and Young's model, I think probably this evidence would argue that you should be using the Bradley model, um, certainly not the McGarry model. But since the Bradley model and the Chu and Young's are so similar, if you did a weighted combination of models, they're very much the same functional form. You might be over overweighting things. But this is all very preliminary. Um, and I don't think we can really, we wouldn't make any recommendations at this point based on this. We need to understand it. Um, a bit more, but this is kind of where we're headed with things, is trying to do much more quantitative assessment of all the models um, available to us. And I guess an important thing here is the New Zealand database is small, so it's not clear exactly how much this is representing. So this would never be the full answer. So we would never, in Europe, they've done the same method, and they've just taken the results directly from this and said, okay, these are, you can develop weights based on this log likelihood score. And they've said, this is our combined model based on that. I don't think we believe our data enough to do that. So we probably wouldn't just go through and say, we're chucking out Bradley because of this. We would probably say that about it and very. Um, but we need, there needs to be some subjective judgment that goes on because of this. Um, I don't know, how am I doing for time? OK. Um, so now into ground motion simulations, which um, is where things are headed in the future, for sure. Um, so these are physics-based computational codes to, to simulate ground motions, given some geologic information that you have. Um, so trying to get around some of the disadvantages of the ground motion prediction, equa prediction equations, largely the lack of data. Um, so the advantage is you can do this, these physics-based models, where you have no ground motion observations. So importantly, for large events, near source, and subduction zone. Um, and you can simulate across multiple scenarios. Disadvantages, um, it's difficult to validate. If you don't have the observations, how do you test it? Um, limited ground motion frequency content, so periods less than one second are difficult to do, and it takes a long time to calculate. Um, can we use this for the, NS, the National Seismic Hazard Model? Certainly, I think we'll get there right now, not quite yet. Um, it depends on several things. Again, this validation, we need to be seeing more validation of the simulation codes against the data that we have to understand what their predictive skill is, and I think people are working on that. Um, improved quantification of fault rupture and subsurface parameters. Some of the models are, are dependent on this, and it, you get into arguments about what's more important between source, paths, and side effects. I think it's most people in mind now, it's really the, the source and the the, pa the site are the most important characteristics, but as you get to certain kinds of prediction or simulations, um, the, the path becomes important, um, and it's going to have to be faster. Uh, however, at this point, and has been done in a couple of places overseas, um, subsets of these results may help us to constrain the model or constrain the ground motion prediction equations. Um, and I just had a couple of movies to show quickly. Um, first is a model done by Rafael Benitez. Um, this is using uh, discrete discrete wave number method. So this is really the pure physics. This is as pure as it gets. It is not affected by gridding, um, anything like that. It's based. It's an analytical solution based on the wave, wave equation. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that it um, demonstrates that the, the high accelerations that we're seeing in Christchurch um, can be explained by the physics of the rupture. You don't need the side effects to, to, to explain that. I'll just run through this a really quick. So you just have the th three different components, the vertical and the two horizontal. Um, and the, you can see the main rupture was going through here. And as you see, the, I won't say too much, but you can watch the propagation of it. And in the near source, in the validate, this is one that's obviously easier to validate for a single prediction, mind you. Um, but we have lots of near source data for this. And the near source, it does really well. As you get further away, it doesn't necessarily do as well. Um, and then an important area, obviously, for the national model is um, 
subduction zone and um, because we don't have the data. And I'll show just some work by Yoshi Kaneko. Um, so this is simulating a magnitude 8.4 on the subduction zone um, using a stochastic slip distribution um, based on past global earthquakes. So it kind of takes an average of similar size earthquakes around the world and uses that as the starting point for his model. Um, and it's a finite element method with um, spectral basis function, if that means anything to you. Um, and the grid is about one kilometer. And the advantage, particularly this one over the Benitez discrete wave number method, is that it can handle complex geometries um, which are important in some places where it is the discrete wave number method can't really do that. But then it comes down to how important is the kind of the, the source, so kind of sorry, not the source, the path. So this one's a bit slower. So the rupture, it's modeling, it's magnitude 8.4. It's, it's, it's something roughly like this is the rupture that's in there that's not shown on this um, and initiating up here and moving down in this direction. And this is uh, velocity. So this, this one's a bit slow. I won't, won't make you sit through the whole thing. But anyway, I, I guess that gives you a picture of what's actually going on. You can see the, the different interactions that are going on and the um, basically some of the advantages of using phys physics-based simulations to do this over, over GMPs. So we're not quite there yet with these being used in the national model, but this is clearly the way of the, the future. And I think Ken knows well with things like the Quake Core, putting some effort into this as well. Uh, so uh, your, your uh, that's sort of rupture that you along the, the, the trench. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Moving south towards Wellington. Yeah, yeah. Starting at the top. Yeah, starting yeah. Halfway up, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Um, so it takes a minute by that to get from to to Wellington. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really yeah, for for yeah. for subduction, it, it would for sure. Yeah, yeah. Maybe for some other events, <laughs> most crustal events, probably not. But for this, it would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And don't even think about how long the shaking goes on. <laughs> yeah, it just keeps going. <laughs> And again, Tohoku in Japan for the magnitude 9, it was seven minutes of shaking, of strong shaking. OK, sorry, I'll try to hurry up here. There's a couple of things left to go through. Um, so just some other key research areas for the future, or current, I guess currently. Um, Mmax, as I mentioned, on the background seismicity, frequency magnitude distributions, how purely Gutenberg-Richter is it? Is there other shapes that should be considered? M max it at the subduction zone. Um, it's currently nine. Why not larger? Um, aftershocks, declustering, all these things that I've talked about. Um, and I won't skip those for now. But really, a key thing is really the, the subduction zone. We have little knowledge of past megathrust, meaning the whole thing going through, and just in general, little knowledge of what's happened in the past. So how can we constrain that? Um, we have no reason to believe it couldn't be a big one, um, but we don't have anything to say about what happened. Does it rupture only in large events? Could we have a lot of magnitude sevens? Um, what can different rupture geometries look like? Um, and importantly, how do these affect ground motions not only in Wellington in the East Coast, but in Auckland? We get these really big events. What does that mean for here? Um, what is a stress drop? This is a control, the stress drop, kind of a, yeah, I, won't, I guess I won't try to explain that too much, but how that's an important term in the ground motions actually occur, and it's something that we don't necessarily know a lot about. Um, and how does this affect ground motions? And this is probably the most poorly constrained part of the model and maybe one of the most important ones um, for what's going on. So that's a big effort going into that from not just, uh, not just from the National Hazard Mapping people, but from other teams as well. Uh, ground motion prediction priorities, strong ground motion database, which we've we more or less ticked off, revising existing GMPEs, um, Chris working into a Fourier Spectre GMPE, uh, numerical modeling, as I've been showing, um, into simulations. Um, how can we take some of that simulated data into existing GMPs? A little bit of that has been done. Some has been done overseas, particularly subduction zone. Um, importantly, right now, where we're putting effort is model uncertainty, um, how we combine multiple models, and validation. More validation. I'm always a big fan of validation. Show me what you're doing works. 
that leads to this. Um, I think everybody knows scientific method, could developing a hypothesis, then testing it. I think in a lot of places, there's a whole lot of hypothesis development going on and not a lot of testing, because it's hard to do, so people tend to forget about it. But this has kind of been a, kind of a something that I've been very focused on in the last 15 years, is if you're going to do all the, the, develop all these models, you better figure out what they're actually telling you. Um, so um, we've been part of kind of what's called the, the New Zealand Earthquake Forecast Testing Center, which is part of this global collaboratory from SCEC, if you're familiar with the Southern California Earthquake Center. It's called CSEP in short. But it's really about developing rigorous statistical methods for testing forecast and hazard models um, and kind of having accepted methods. And um, it goes a bit over the top in terms of having a really structured computational framework so everything's completely honest and you know what's going on and it's all repeatable and so on. But it's working. Um, it's been going for about 10 years now. Um, these different countries are involved. So um, and there's other aspects of it. So it does retrospective testing and so on. Um, but since about 2007, 2008, we've been daily testing a whole range of forecast models and seeing how they perform against New Zealand observations. Um, and I think kind of one misperception about testing, it's not, you don't only test to figure out which models are rubbish and you can forget about and that's part of it maybe. Um, but you can also learn a lot about your, your own model and say, okay, it's maybe not doing so well in this part, so maybe we need to think about how we might adjust it here. And that's actually one of the key things that comes out of that. Um, but unfortunately, it's difficult to test kind of on 50 year time frames for any particular scientific project because people get bored. <laughs> Um, so just a couple results. Um, I won't go into the details of that. Um, um, for the, this is testing of the National Seismic Hazard Model. Short-term tests, take those for what they're worth um, against recorded number of earthquakes. The forecasts do very well on these kind of five to 10 year time periods. Um, Long-term tests against recorded ground motions. In general, so these are kind of statistical tests. In general, the model does, around most of the country, the model does pretty well against these ground motion tests. But because it doesn't include aftershocks, there's enough ground motions kind of at the 0.1 to 0.2 G, so small level, but enough to get data from, that it's under predicting the number of accelerations you would, you would um, that, that we actually ob observed at those time frames. Um, and that's purely because it's not including the effect of aftershocks, which we've all seen is, is important. Um, and so now into one that's maybe a bit more of interest, but a bit more complicated. So this is retrospective testing of, the, of a Canterbury type model against, so it is the Canterbury model, but applied to the entire country with the exact same parameters um, and run from 1984 to 2009. So I'll, each one of these are different, either a subcomponent of the bigger Canterbury model or some other independent model. Um, and the way you read this graph is that if the circle is to the left of this dashed line, it means that this particular subcomponent model was worse than the Canterbury model. Um, and if it's outside of these, these error bars here, it means it, it was significantly worse than the Canterbury model. Um, so in general, you can see looking at this time period, um, all of these component models were worse, most of them significantly worse until you get down to this AVVAX model, which more or less, maybe it performed a little bit better, but more or less the same. And this was actually the model that we were using before we developed the Canter this Canterbury specific model. And the difference was this one is a statistically optimized model where the Canterbury one had a whole lot of subjectivity put into it. <laughs> yeah, didn't make much difference, but yeah, possibly we could have stopped there. The forecast would have more or less been the same from either model. So this was based on work that we had published in 2010, this particular model. Um, and the final thing on testing, um, which it's a hard thing to get your head around sometimes. People, a lot of people are skeptical of this work. I haven't quite figured out where I've got. Um, but so we need for, we're talking about probabilities of 10% in 50 years or 2% in 50 years for the National Seismic Hazard Model. So things that aren't really that all that likely to occur don't happen all that often. So how can we test that? beyond just looking at shaking observations. So one thing that Mark Sterling's put a lot of time into, as well as people around, other people around the world, is looking at what's called fragile geological features. So things like this um, that you don't think would really stand up to strong ground shaking. And you can see this one's actually marked up quite a bit. Um, so they've done 
significant about a significant amount of numerical modeling of this. They've had similar structures on shake tables, all kinds of crazy stuff um, to understand what kind of shaking probabilistically would take these structures down, and then they go map the features to try to get an idea of whether or not what you see in the field is consistent with the data. Um, so there's maybe some promise in this. It has been used in nuclear, some nuclear power plant projects in the U.S. to try to help constrain their hazard. Okay, just now kind of at the final, final thoughts here at the end. So given the uncertainties um, that I've outlined here, is the model as developed and given to the community the most useful to the end user community? And I think this is something that we as the model developers need um, a lot more discussion with those who are using it to, to understand that. Um, right now, I'm not so sure. Um, and then second, in general, the building design standard is hazard-based rather than risk-based. Um, and again, given what we've talked about here and thinking beyond that, um, is there a need for a risk layer between the national seismic hazard model and the standard and should collective risk be considered? And that particularly, I would say, becomes important for places like Auckland with the level of information that we, we have for it. Um, just final summary, um, currently working on a revision um, of the national model, approved an additional quantification of source uncertainty is important. Um, ground motion modeling, kind of getting up to speed with what's happening around the world and um, using uncertainty across multiple models, the Hickerang and Megathrust, um, and then as I was just mentioning, more interaction with the end user community to really think about is the scientifically developed model the right model for, for the end users and how might we do things differently um, if we were to start over. Um, and then finally, um, this open, which we're getting close to is open availability um, of the national model. So thanks very much. Yep. Thank you. I just want to make sure I got the right axis. It's a long way back, isn't it? Did I, did I miss it? Yeah, I think I did. Um, Brendan's one seemed to sort of depart from the others when the period was five, six, and... Yeah, at the long period. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that significant for what we, the information we need in engineering? Yeah, I prefer you tell me that, I guess, but I, I suspect it, it's, it's probably not. It's more, so I think this isn't necessarily the concern. It's, uh, what, it's, it's that it's consistently high across here. But again, as I said, this is a limited data set, so we don't want to put, and preliminary results in a limited data set, so we don't want to put too much weight into this um, until the results are finalized. But it'd be more in here that I would be, if we are only the only reason that we might at this point think not to use Bradley would be because it is more or less the same as this Chu and Young's, and if we're using a weighted combination of models, we don't want to have two models in there that are very much the same because then we're going to overbalance that. Um, so there's no consequence of that mismatch of the longer periods that does something to us at the, at the shorter period where the no, this would really be only for structures that are out, out here. Um, we did, there's lots of different ways we could look at this. I don't have all the figures here, um, but yeah. Yeah, Matt, yeah, David Hopkins, my name. Uh, I just wanted to compliment you on your presentation. Thank you. I've been fascinated by this sort of stuff for many years, actually, and I'd like to share with you that. Uh, in 1976, a uh, paper was produced by a certain guy called Warren Smith, and it was the first one in the Earthquake Society's journal to show an isocytical uh, sort of predictive model. Yeah, yeah. And we awarded that a, uh, the NZSC award for the paper because of its sort of pioneering um, element to yeah. it. And I can't imagine how, what N is when I think that got n degrees of sophistication more <laughs> than he would have been using then. So totally fascinating, and thank you. I do have a question. Um, in, I think it was 2004, after the work on the Alpine Fault, this, the seismicity model changed hugely in the region of the Alpine Fault, and in particular in Queenstown, 
with a coefficient made up by something factorial of two. And this is quite significant in terms of, let's say, our design standards and also rating buildings for earthquake, for instance. So knowing what you know about the model and the seismicity of New Zealand, do you see any more surprises of that sort of magnitude, or can we sort of sit back and relax a little more? <laughs> <laughs> Difficult question. Um, the, the science is always evolving, I guess. I mean, I, I, I don't foresee that that might happen, but it, it's certainly possible. Uh, I think that possibly gets at my last, second to last slide here about um, making sure um, that what we're providing is the most useful. And, yeah, and also this one. Um, just because the hazard has gone up in one location, does that necessarily mean, considering everything else that the building design standard should be thinking about, does that mean that the standard should be significantly impacted? Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? The thing that I think was that incorporated in the current Yeah. Yeah, so there, it's in there. Um, I'd say relatively simplistically, but it, it does. It, there is the fault geometry um, going um, all along the east coast. Essentially, it accounts for there's about four different possibilities of ruptures on that, including a magnitude nine is the largest, um, and the smallest I think is about a magnitude eight point one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and where, how you split up, because if you have magnitude 8 point, so you saw from Yoshi's stuff in magnitude 8.4 covered about here. Um, so you can imagine there's an infinite combination of where those 8.4s could go. And do you just randomly put those everywhere, or can you constrain that better? Yeah. When you uh, combine sort of the hazard contributions from the faults, the major faults, and the background seismicity, sort of the unknown and smaller faults, how was that done? Can you talk a bit about, a bit more about? Yeah, the, um, I think you did touch on it a little bit. It sort of showed that it couldn't very quickly. Victory. Sort of swing out the bottom, perhaps for a. Yeah. Like um, this is um, this is one of the problems in my mind that the model is an algorithm and not a model. Um, so if we had a proper model, you'd add in faults and it would automatically balance that somehow with the background seismicity. Um, but by default, if you find new fault, the hazard's going to go up in the model. And you have to go in after the fact and look at that Gutenberg-Richter distribution and say, OK, what has happened here? Can we balance that based on, say, geodesy and look at our overall moment rate? So how much moment are these earthquakes that we're saying are going to happen? Is that consistent with what we would expect based on the plate convergence rates, based on the geodesy? Um, and then you rebalance it back that way. Did that, did that make any sense? Can you just show the, the Is there any hope in creating a, a model as opposed to a program? I think so. Um, that's big diagrams on my board right now that I've been spending a lot of time on over the last year trying to to get around that through using stochastic events that so kind of randomly sampling earthquakes and I think we I think we can do it. Yeah. So you get a particular rate for, for a region from the, from the database. Yeah. And then you have your major faults and there's is this related to the gap you were, you were talking about before in terms of? So you would, um, to balance it in the end, you would actually take all the sources. So we'd have the 536 um, at, the, at the first level, first order. You take all the 536 faults, all the background sources, and combine them in a, a plot like this, I guess, and look at the, the magnitude distribution there. Then you look at the moment release from that total combined. Um, and see if that makes sense, if there's adjustments that need to happen. And you can also then break that down regionally, particularly based on what we know from geodetic strain and converting that into moment, which is, again, tricky to do. But you can do that and try to balance that out um, by the number of earthquakes that you, you have and where you put them. So it's, it's not exact by any means. Yeah. It's, a, it's a big problem. And they, and they, in the US, they've, they've talked a lot about the battle of the bulge. So they, the, the background seismicity and the, 
and the fault models come together about here, so they quite often get, they've had this problem in the US where they get this bump here that they've really struggled to get rid of. Yeah. Uh, you said uh, we don't know about the, um, any past rupture on the uh, subduction zone. No, I know a little bit from paleo, some paleo work. So what's yeah. the last uh, date that's uh, um, known for uh, I'd, get, I'd get it wrong if I tried to actually tell you. And we, I don't think we know how, how big that was. But work from Kate Wilson and Ursula Cochran have, been, have done some looking at various lagoons up and down the east coast and on the upper south island trying to understand that. And I, I better not say it because be, I'll be wrong. And, and there's, there's been no dating from internationally. I'm just thinking about Cascadia. Yeah. Pretty precisely based on international stuff. And yeah. And of course, here, I guess, the. Yeah. The yeah. yeah, right. Where you yeah, it. right. Yeah. So, possibly Chathams, there could be some dating going there and, and on to South America. Yeah. But, yeah, there's hopefully a big project starting soon that's going to be putting a lot more effort into this. Yeah.